Greetings, darklings, from across the interweb. It is I, the Duchess, Precious Ken, once again for the Sounds and Shadows podcast. It is good to be with you all. I have with me my dear friend to the left. It's Colin Skipper, your gothic librarian today. (laughs) (laughs) Really excited to be here. Missing all you. To the right, it's <clears throat> Katie May, also here. And we have an extremely two special guests, two for the price of one, an excellent value on today's podcast. Um, I also have uh, what one might call a big fuck off glass of wine. So we'll see where this goes. That's, that's a and- properly sized glass. Yeah, sure. Yeah. That's like half a bottle of wine right there in that glass. But um, I also have here uh, from two different bands uh, ready to talk with us about something new and exciting to start with. Dan, who I think between the Pink Floyd, the Joy Thieves, and now this, next to Katie and Colin, you are the person who has been on the Sounds and Shadows podcast the most. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, this will be, this is my third time, actually. So. Yeah, you will have to get you, like, on Saturday Night Live, like, one of those coats or something. Right? Big number three on it, yeah. yeah welcome to the crew. <laughs> and we're also really, really excited, somebody that we have not had on yet, um, from a band that is very near and dear to my heart. I mean, in my opinion, like I said, I, I've written about this and done several articles on A Covenant of Thorns, but doing something I miss so much in the scene right now, which is true, beautiful, romantic goth. Um, And it's, I don't know, something like, I think that's just a bit of a lost art and has been doing it. Scott David, it's wonderful to have you here with us. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Why don't we start out, um, for those of you, I mean, I I gushed a little there, but um, for those of you that aren't as familiar, uh, why don't we go Dan and then Scott David, tell us a little bit about what your other projects are, and then we'll move on from there into the new project that we're going to talk about, uh, just to give people a little background about who you are. Cool. Yeah. Um, well, I think you and most people know me probably from a band called the Joy Thieves, uh, which is like an industrial collective of musicians. We have like, I think, almost 50 mer- members at this point in time. Uh, and that includes a lot of a lot of dear friends of mine and a lot of people from other bands like Ministry and KMFDM, My Life of the Thrill, Kill Cult, Big Face, that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, we're just kind of a wild a collective of musicians who just write and record music together. So that's that's my main thing. I think when you have like Chris Connolly in your band and shit, you don't call it a collective. You call that a super band, Dan. Just just to be clear, like that's what super band means. You know, I people. Yeah, I know. I, I have a problem with the word super group. <laughs> and this is just me. There's, not, there's nothing wrong with the word. I just don't. It makes me feel uncomfortable a little bit. Uh, and I'm, I'm letting you feel a little uncomfortable for a moment. I, okay, I appreciate that. You know, I look at the other members and I go, yeah, that's a super group. And then when I realize that I'm like the, the head of it, then it doesn't feel super anymore. It just feels like a, like a thing I do. As discussed earlier, you are a super peach. Oh, super peach. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> Scott Dave. Well, I have about 49 fewer members. It's just me. Uh, a covenant of thorns <laughs> that's called efficiency bro that's efficiency yeah, yeah. um i don't know what do i say um you talk about a covenant of thorns like when you guys started um sure. some of the journey on your music um i think with, so i think i started in somewhere around 93 but officially sort of the first release um was the first ep was 1998 I believe, um, and now I'm what nine nine releases later. Um, if you're not familiar, I guess it's uh, I don't I'm not sure what it is. It's synth pop, dark wave. Uh, I'm not much for labels. I thought's. I'd say both those are in the in the ballpark, you know, for sure. Yeah, um, it's pretty much just me. <laughs> just, Why don't you? 
before we get into talking about the project we're going to, you just had a very recent release, the album Black. Um, yeah. And why don't you start out, just talk a little bit about that release, what it meant to you, where people can get a copy, things like that. Sure, sure. Um, let's see, Black. Black is the third full length, I believe. Um, I started working on that about a month before I finished the, the previous release, um, Shadows and Serenades. And um, you can purchase it at acot.bandcap.com. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, this one, um, I think this one maybe was a bit darker than the last one. Last one, it's maybe, maybe, maybe a, a bit poppier. This one, um, I think I explored um, some, some new, some new synthesizers. Maybe that were on the darker side. The content's a little dark, but I, I guess it's always a little dark. Um, cherry guy. <laughs> <laughs> we're, you're, I mean, you know what? A lot. I found that in general, a lot of people in the goth dark wave shot. A lot of us are cheery. There's nothing wrong with being a cheery goth. You know. Yeah, I mean, honestly, you you might be surprised at at how uh, how different I am from the music I write. But I, I think um, the music I write allows me to to sort of um, express the things that if I didn't otherwise would would probably turn me into a pretty dark person. Right. I'm I'm right there with you. I mean, I think there's a few people like the Swans or something like they're fucking serious. Like they no, they really are like <laughs> that. I think, but like. I, I think with a couple of exceptions, very often what you're saying is very true, Scott David. Um, just that, you know, a lot of times music is a way to get that out and it doesn't necessarily represent the core of who you are. Like, I don't know, maybe you are. You're going to finish this interview, you're going to hit the stop button, and then you're just going to curl up in a ball and cry. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what your <laughs> life is, but, you know. No, I, I think it's it's pretty it's pretty cathartic. Um, I, I think... Uh, Generally speaking, I don't know, Dan and I, we, we joke around a lot. Um, Dan could probably attest that um, I'm, I'm generally speaking, not all that serious. Um, but when I, when I write, I guess uh, that's where uh, my deep troubled past comes out. I don't know. Yeah. No, no, I, that's beautiful. So the next thing where I want to push this, now that we've got introductions out of the way, is, all right, this is a special story for me. I'm yeah. not going to lie. This, this is pretty exciting. It's kind of a special how exactly did you two come together and form this project? Was there What's, any uh, impetus that kind of brought that wonderful meeting of these minds into the artistic endeavor, which you now are going to be doing? Well, it's take, funny that I'll, you mentioned I'll, that. Yeah, <laughs> I'll take, funny, funny you mention it, man. Yeah, I mean, this, the project that we're talking about is called The Burying Kind, and it would not exist if it were not for Ken because he introduced me to Scott David a little over a year ago. And we started working together shortly thereafter. Um, we did the very first song we did, I did a remix for the Joy Thieves for one of Scott David's songs um, off of Shadows and Serenades. And I just fell in love with the song. I, I just loved it so much. Um, <clears throat> especially when you're doing remixes, you get pretty involved with the music and you get pretty involved hearing the voices. And I just, I just adore doing it. And, uh, and that was how we, we met. And it was definitely through Ken. And I'm, Ken, I'm actually I'm gonna ask you because I'm totally curious about this myself. I've got a question for you for once. Wow, okay, we're flipping so, it around. Yeah, the tables so, have turned. I know, right? So we were, you were putting together this album where, and you approached a bunch of different artists and you started connecting different people um, who were, some people wanted to do remixes for other people. Some people wanted to collaborate, that sort of thing. And, and the first person, I think the first and only person that you recommended that I listened to was A Covenant of Thorns. And I'm curious why, like what, between me, because what you would know me as doing from the Joy Thieves and what Scott David does, it's the world of difference, really. I, I started, I did that for a lot of people, actually. Mm -hmm. And so what we're talking about is uh, Tiny Gods, so Walk Among Us, and it was the compilation that we did um, that a bunch of amazing artists, including these two, came together uh, to contribute for my cat, uh, Freya, who is doing wonderful, by the way, running around on her little three legs, um, happy as can be, and was able to kind of save her from a really scary, enormous tumor of 
aggressive cancer. Um, and so they took her leg off to do that, but that solved the problem. And so I had all of these artists who came to me and like wanted to contribute. And I wasn't sure how to use everybody because I had never done this before. And so I just started thinking, um, Colin, did you have something you needed to add? Well, yeah. So I just wanted to chime in here because so Ken and I were sitting around in his kitchen and we had gotten together and one, we're going through the list of all the bands that said they were going to contribute mm -hmm. to this album. And we were falling all over ourselves. Just holy shit. I can't believe that so many Who's people this person even here. Yeah. Like we, what, I was including myself in this. We don't deserve this. <laughs> like all this attention and, and how wonderful everybody was. So we were sitting in the kitchen and we started grouping everybody kind of into similar genres of music as much as we could. And then we had this idea, mostly Ken, it was Ken, but we had this idea that it would be really cool to start pairing off people that were just not at all be yeah. the match you would think of because so many times you get remix compilations and things like that. And it's, it's like, yeah, no, that makes sense but we wanted to throw a loop for that. So we had everybody written down and then it started turning into one of those pins and string maps. And I, I remember Ken said, giggling maniacally with glee. Oh my God, can you imagine the Joy Thieves and a Covenant of Thorns? And I just screamed, yes, at the top of my lungs. So that's my little tidbit. In that that is we so in awesome, I love that. That's great. And, and there were a lot of pairings like that that I thought was really cool because a lot of these people I'd met through our reviews or things like that, but didn't know each other. You know, it was a European, you know, dark wave goth band like Crying Vessel. And then Ed, um, you know, dead agent uh, in the Chicago industrial scene and just getting a chance to kind of like pair these up and watch it happen and watch something that because of this horrible thing with my cat never would have happened otherwise. So anyhow, the two of you then met and started working together and here's where, so you had me and it'll be out by then. So it's okay that I talk about this. You had me do a foreword for the album after hearing it, which I, was just at a loss. Like, I mean, it's not always too that like me and Rachel will be as excited about the same album. It just doesn't happen a ton because our musical tastes aren't always exactly dead on. And we were both just like jumping up and down, dancing in the kitchen together, playing this record with just glee and excitement, like, oh my God. And I think what I really kind of want to start out asking is, Dan, your background is, is an industrial guy. And Scott David, I mean, yours is a dark wave goth, you know, guy. This album was the best shoegaze album that I've heard in forever. Like it, it really, truly, I mean, like the layers and textures of this, the amount of just time and thought I can tell that went into the pedal board of figuring out the, the guitar effects on it is some Kevin Shield shit right here. <laughs> and so tell me, how did the two of you, you get together, you start talking, you become fast friends. How does that turn into slushy, beautiful, whimsical shoegaze? Uh, I'm gonna share something with you, Ken, that I don't, I don't think you know before, before I get to answer that. So, so Dan had done the remix, right, which was incredible. Um, it's a really intimate, personal thing to have someone else work on your music, especially, especially when for, you know, years and years, I've been the only one touching this. And I was really impressed by it, and I thought, man, I really want to work with this guy. But I was a little, uh, I don't know, I was a little, a little timid about it because, I mean, this is, this is Dan Milligan from the Joy Thieves, right? Um, I actually heard him on your show, on this very show, talking about how he felt that way when he reached out to work with Chris Connolly. And that was what pushed me over the edge to, to contact him and say, hey, you know, maybe sometime we could work on something. COVID, it had just hit. Um, 
we decided to do a song and just see how it worked. And I mean, it just, it just kept going. We, we were just writing and writing and, and uh, we didn't really set out to, we didn't sit down and say, Hey, let's write a shoegaze album. Let's, it, it just kind of organically evolved. Um, we both, we both really love um, slow dive and, you know, my bloody Valentine, stuff like that. But it was, it was never something we set out to do. We had just sort of evolved into that. That's incredible. I, God damn it, I'm right back in it. Um, <laughs> no, that's incredible. And I, I still, I wonder then, like, I mean, did you kind of put forth a song that was kind of similar to what you usually would do with a Covenant of Thorns and it evolved into this? Or did you both kind of come together and start at this point of, of this different synthesis thing? You know, I, I think it was, uh, other than 100% Dan does the drums. I mean, there's, there's not a debate on that, right? I'm, I'm not gonna try to do drums, he's got that. Um, and, and, and generally speaking, I'm doing the vocals. Other than that, the songwriting process is, is, is really either one of us presenting something, there's no rules. The, the only rule is like, we both have to just really love what we're doing. Um, so, so there's, there's no real formula to get from, from A to Z. It just, it, it's, it is truly organic. I mean, uh, um, Dan can speak more to this, but half the time now, a year later, I listen to it and I don't even remember what part I'm doing versus what part he's doing. It, it just, it just became its own thing. So, well, I, I have a question on that too. Um, when you guys are bringing songs to each other, are, are you starting to work on something and then thinking to yourself, this isn't a covenant of thorns. This isn't joy thieves. This is, this is very in kind. Yeah. When did that transition happen? Uh, I'll, I'll jump in here. I, you know, I, it, it's a good question. I, and you wouldn't know this necessarily because we haven't known each other for that long, but I mean, I, it was funny. I mean, when I hear Ken refer to me as like the industrial guy, that's true. I mean, I, and I do the, the joy thieves, but my background is in all types of music. I mean, I'm a professional musician and over the years I've, I've played in every kind of band under the sun and I've written music in you know, in all types of genres. Um, so it's not, so it's just funny to hear myself described that way. Anyway, um, I have always loved this kind of music and have never had a forum to do it, honestly. Um, and we never had any discussions about this at all. There was never one discussion about what we were gonna sound like. There was never one discussion about, I wanna write stuff like this and I wanna write stuff like that. It literally jumped, jumped off with one of us sending a song to the other one and the other one said, I love it and adding parts to it. And then it just, that process happened over and over and over and over. I don't remember ever sending something to him and him saying, no, I don't like it and vice versa, everything he sent my way. And, and I'm exactly with him. Like at, at this point, when I'm listening to like the EP that we're gonna release, I have no idea who wrote what, to be honest. I have no idea. The, the things that he was writing and the way that he writes is very similar to how I would write music. And, and it was so natural that there was no thought put into it at all, which is, it was, it's truly amazing. It's, it's um, I've been in a lot of bands and a lot of things like, it's, it's very uncommon to sync with somebody that immediately especially with no discussions about where we're going it just it just started and it was, it's been on ever since yeah it's it's same from from my perspective I've, I've always anytime i've worked with people you know inevitably there comes a day when someone says i want it to be more barry manilow and you're not feeling barry manilow right i mean it, <laughs> it didn't I'm always really... feel barry manilow like usually <laughs> but I, it, I, I take your point i mean it was a bad example everybody's feeling barry manilow um but I mean, as far as when we realized there was sort of a varying kind kind of sound, I, I remember it happening. I don't remember when it happened. It just sort of one day we just sort of realized, hey, we've we've kind of got the sound going, and and there's no real intent to keep the sound going. It just it just kind of is what it is. Yes, um, that's awesome. And actually, now that I've heard the whole story and got to it, I was really excited to go through it. But next to the Blue Hour, this is now my second favorite meet cute on Sounds and Shadows now. That's number two. Oh. <laughs> um, so we talked a little bit there about, 
you know, what it kind of meant and what that moment was that it was the, the burying kind. The name itself, I think is very interesting. Where did that come from? How did you guys come up with it? And what does that mean? I'll take this one because it's, it's my bad idea. Um, I, <laughs> I, do, band names are terrible. I mean, like I, I have a hard time with band names. I really do. Trying to find something that wraps up everything that you're doing in a couple of words is almost impossible. And these days there's so many bands out there. Find, finding something original is also tough. I think a lot of bands have been down that road. Um, where it originally came from for me is there's, there's an old phrase. There's actually an old 50s movie. It's called The Marrying Kind. Um, and that's a phrase, you know, he's the marrying kind. And, and what that put, it's, it's all, oh, he's, he's the type who would be married or that sort of thing. And I have a very dark side to my brain. And, it, and that's the first thing that I thought of, the, the burying kind. What, what does that bring to mind necessarily? And I think I a Anna Nicole list. Smith kind of situation. Uh. <laughs> 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 but it just, it, I, I, I enjoyed the twist of something that's so positive and then give it, giving it that darker edge. Um, and I wrote it on a piece of paper years ago. And when we were trying to think, we we're like, well, we, you know, now that we're going to do this thing for real, we should have a name, I guess. And we just kind of threw out a couple of things and neither of us hated that. And so that's what it became. Nice. Katie, do you want to turn? I've been talking a lot. I know that. I was wondering when it came to the lyrics, how they really came together for this album. Like, was there any direct inspiration or was it a story that you were trying to convey with most of the lyrics? Like, uh, what's the story behind the words? Yeah, um, well, I mean, it is, as well as just the entire thing, um, the whole COVID pandemic kind of pay, played a, a huge role in it. And I think lyrically it was either things that had happened to me personally or observations of other things that I'd seen during, you know, this, this new life that we're living. Um, so it, it's, it's sort of a, it's a mixture of, of sort of, you know, feeling hopeless at times and, and, and feeling um, the need to, to sort of prop yourself up and keep going. Um, the relationships personally and things I've seen about people propping each other up during it. Um, so I think really that's what it, this, this EP in particular sort of tied it together. All right. I'm going to step outside my wheelhouse here. Oh boy. And, and this is pretty, this is pretty downright anti Ken to get into this shit. But like I said, I was blown away with the craftsmanship of the guitar work on this. And it, it just like, a, I like some shoegaze music, you know, I, you know, especially, you know, the, the greats, My Bloody Valentine. I mean, to me, I'm more in the vein of like a Jesus and Mary chain for stuff like that. I like my shoegaze to be a little like poppy, you know, but tell me about the guitar tones that you guys went into craft on this, because like I said, it's so far outside the wheelhouse from anything I've heard either of you do before. And what did you do to set about kind of crafting together that tone? What did you use for, in terms of guitars, pedals and things like that for it? And God, I'm fucking, I'm being a nerd like Colin. Tell me about the nerdy shit about your guitars on this album. Go ahead, Scott, David. Um, <clears throat> Is this, is this an okay time to, to mention some of the, some of the other uh, guitar help we had? Uh, That'd be a great time. This is a perfect time. So, um, Mr. Everybody's favorite, Mr. Gordon Young. Uh, Gord, Gord played guitar as well on, on every track. And this guy... I, I, that always helps. Yeah, I mean, it, it instantly... That always helps. Like, it, it really just makes everything better. It instantly makes things like quite a bit more credible as far as the guitar work. Um, he comes up with these amazing tones and, and I've had lengthy conversations with him and, and I, I try the things he says and I, I never get it, but he, he's just, he's a master at what he does. So um, a lot of that, that sort of my bloody Valentine sort of feel is, is Gord. Uh, a lot of the really sort of uh, intricate picking and, and interesting airy guitar chords, Dan, and then uh, there's me, 
who <laughs> do play guitar. I've played guitar probably longer than I played synth, believe it or not. But um, I layered tons of effects and 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 loads of reverb on it, um, just to hide the fact that I'm a pretty mediocre guitar player. <laughs> so I think the three of those kind of layered on top of each other made for a, for a sort of interesting dynamic. Yes. Well, now I wish I had called Gordon and brought him in too, and I could grill him about this guitar sound. Uh, Dan, do you got anything to add on there? I, I was going to say, it, it's too bad Gord's not here because he would dork out with you in the biggest way. You had no idea what he would tell you. He would go into shop talk like you've never. Yeah, he would. To have a little Sons and Shadows tech talk. 20 yeah, we can tech talk. edit Gordon later, you know. And yeah. <laughs> He's the best. He's one of those players too that I mean he, he's he's a master of the gear, obviously, <clears throat> but kind of like what Scott David was saying, there there are players and if you could set up the exact same rig for two people, it's going to sound completely different. He's got it's the way he uh, it's his hands. It's not the gear, you know what I mean? Like he's he's got the touch that that makes it so good, and that, that's what I love about Gord. I, he does. I think <laughs> I think it's partially what you're saying there is you're right. Like, I mean, he definitely has that touch, but to me, when I hear this, and, and the reason why I said and went to like Kevin Shields when I was talking about it is, I hear this tone, and I remember like Josh, our guitar player was a lot like this. There's just people, I am not one of them, who have the patience and level of detail to just sit there and tweak a knob, one twist, and play a riff and tweak a knob, one twist, and play a riff, and do that for 14 pedals. And I, I get, that's what I take away that like must have happened with Gord on this album, because you can tell every single note sounds so deliberate and perfectly thought out. And like, I, I don't know, like, I mean, I can say that, you know, in, in just a lot of music that I hear, you can really tell when someone went an extra level pre-thinking before they ever played a note, what that was going to sound like. And, and to me, that's what I hear in this album and, and part of what blew me away. Well, one, one of the things that I really love, and I mean, again, you wouldn't know this about me because I'm maybe the industrial guy to you, but I mean, like, the, but a lot of my musical life before this was in ambient sort of music, soundtrack sort of sort of style. And, and I literally, I mean, I, I don't consider myself a guitar player. I know enough to, all I want, ever wanted to know was enough to write, to write music. Um, so for me, being a drummer, what that equates to is finding the craziest tunings on the guitar that I can and experimenting with the sound of it until it's something that I like. Um, because if you're looking for technique, that's not going to be me. Um, but finding the sound is to me like 90% of, of what makes me happy about that sort of thing. So I, I love hearing that you're saying that because that's, that's the sort of thing that I'm totally into. And, and I guess the other part was that I, um, I did the mix on this particular EP. And so from the very beginning, I was keeping those things in mind because I, um, because I knew I was going to be the one who had to mix it later. It wouldn't be somebody else's problem. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, so all um, put all those things together, and, and that's uh, hopefully an answer without getting too tech talky because it's not really my thing. But I know I, it's. You know, it's just. Yeah, go ahead. Into it you doing the mixing on it. And I gotta say, another thing that I really hear in this album is when you have that perfect storm of the person mixing it, who wrote it, and is actually in love with their own song. And, and I don't mean that in a, like, but, but it is, it's a perfect storm when it happens that you don't hear a lot. And I can't explain it. I. God knows I can't explain anything technical, but I know it when I hear it. And this album, when I heard it, I was like, it has love in it. It actually, you can hear the artistry of how much it meant to you guys. And I don't know, it's an extra peak or valley in the sound wave or whatever you want to call it. But I can really hear how much detail time like a little baby <laughs> you went through Dan into sitting down with this 
And this was not a quick album that just you guys got together and like fired it out the shoot. Like this has been a long time coming. Like I know that you guys have been working on this for not like people do now, three month albums or like five month. You guys have been working at this for a long time. And I feel like really getting the detail on it. Talk me through a little bit about what that process was like and kind of the sending stuff back and forth to each other and what that felt like. Well, uh, on my end for the mix thing, it, this whole thing happened just at the right time anyway. I, I mean, we kind of mentioned a little bit before, but um, in the middle of March when the entire world went on lockdown is, is when we connected about making music and typically through the summer month, through the spring, summer and fall, I'm a professional performer. So I'm playing usually like four to six times a week. It's, it's almost all I have time to do. And this particular year, all of that was gone all at once. So I had all day and all night, every day and every night to do, and I needed things. I, I needed things to do to keep me sane. And this became one of those things that was really helping me through that time. I can't even calculate the hours that we spent. I mean, I'm so glad to hear that you say that, um, that you can feel the love because we put in so much time. And honestly, there were so many times where we would just get like, you just send each other messages like, I can't believe this is us. You know, like how, how did this happen? Like it's better than you and it's better than me. How did this, if there was a synthesis thing that happened that just was surprising to both of us. And I think the songs and, and the production of it was, it was awesome. It was so much fun. Yeah. I mean, I, I think to, to say that, that the amount of love that was put into it, I mean, I absolutely love every moment of, of this project. It, it's, it's, it's never a chore. I mean, I looked forward to the fact that I knew Dan was working on something, would send it over. Couldn't wait to work on it. I mean, had plenty of free time because of COVID. So, I mean, this, this probably isn't something you're supposed to say, but if, if nobody ever bought one copy of, of the EP, just the friendship that Dan and I have made and, and, and the love I think that we both have for what we're doing, it, it, I'd, I'd do it a million times over again. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's really strange. It's hard to describe. It, it's, it's so different than I think anything that you'd expect from either of us necessarily. Maybe Dan. Dan's done a lot more kind of stuff more similar to this. But I mean, even Dan says himself, I'm the drummer. I'll be the first to tell you, Dan's not just the drummer. I mean, incredibly talented. And, and it, it's, it's really exciting. The moment he, he kind of texts me and says, hey, I'm sending you something, I'm giddy. I mean, I'm, I'm, because I know what's coming over. And, and I think that passion and that love for, for what we're doing, it, it's just, it's so much fun. It's so much fun. I, I think that's the other factor in kind of what I'm talking about in this. The fun is what I can hear. It's a, it's a dark tone to the music. I mean, with you, Scott David, I mean, that's, that's your voice and how you sing. I mean, it's, you know, a lot of Robert Smith, a lot of, I mean, that's just going to be there. But I think at the same time, there really is this beautiful, I don't know, like friendship you can fucking hear in between the notes of the song. And like, that's part of what makes it good. Um, I kind of wanted to transition a little bit more into this because, I mean, you said, I don't care if anybody ever buys this. And I, I feel like that about a lot of, you know, records or songs I do too. And I can assure you people are going to buy this because it's really absurdly good. Um, but the other thing I saw, I was not the only one that you reached out to to send a copy of to, you know, kind of get some quotes on this. And I mean, who gives a shit what I say anyway? Um, I'm definitely not the foremost expert, but there, I read the rest of them. And these are other people that I respect the shit out of as music critics in the scene, DJs. And it was affirming to me that everybody else on there sounded exactly like me that when they heard this they can't necessarily always you know we don't say it in the same way when we describe it as pundits or whatever but we all felt it that this was something special what does it feel like to have that kind of a critical 
reception from people who judge music. I mean, that's, I don't know, us fucking assholes. And, and to hear that back about a project that you guys did together, what, what was that moment like for you? I, I'll take this one because I sent most of them out to you guys. Um, you know, it, it was 10 months of us just doing our own thing with our heads down and having fun. There's, I'd be lying if I said there wasn't a time where you get to the end of it and it's like, maybe people don't like it. I mean, it, it's not, it's not unheard of, you know, that you, that something that you would really enjoy could fall on other ears and people might not hear it the way that you do, or they don't have the emotion vested into it that you do. And they just, maybe it's just not for them. So I was a little bit nervous um, to send them out, but I was also excited because I was, over, I'm over the moon with this EP. I think it's amazing. So, um, so I was a little bit nervous to send them out and I was, I wouldn't say shocked that the reception was good, but I was pleasantly surprised uh, kind of across the board. It was, I think because it came from me and people do know me from the joy thieves and they might have a certain thing in mind, kind of always the first sentence was like, what the fuck is this? You know, like what, why did you, who is this? Like, well, who's singing? What is the, what is going on with this? Because I think that they thought it might be, um, more industrial or more rock or something like that, which it's not. Um, but hearing that sort of thing from people like you can, and it, it is important to me. And especially as a new band, we, you know, there's 10 people on this entire planet who have heard this so far. And, and the fact that a lot of them seem to enjoy what it is, it's, it's super reaffirming to me. I think DJ Sunil Khanna really summed it up. Perfect. Give me. <laughs> <laughs> I love Sunil. <laughs> yeah, when he, he and he's been a fan of of uh, the Joy Thieves and the Covenant of Thorns. So I mean, I think when he heard of this, he was immediately one of the first people who was like, "I have to hear this. I have to know what's going on." I always love his positivity, but that was he, that was absolutely perfect. Just just yeah, that's I, I, exactly what I thought the first time I heard it too. Gimme, gimme, need. <laughs> I think and, Sunil. I love talking to him because he's the only person I know of that can keep up with my level of enthusiasm. Like, and when the two of us get together at like 2 a.m. or something, like I am each other and he's in text and I, like it gets downright dumb, just the amount of like schoolgirl giddiness when we <laughs> talk about music. Like it, I can't think of anybody else that I talk to that like it just gets that kooky when me and Sunil are talking at 2 a.m. or whatever, so. <laughs> This, and this is one of the reasons that, we, that we've become friends, too. We have plenty of these music conversations late at night, too. And I, and I do the same with him. It's so funny. There's this little circle of people who's just up all hours of the night and, and just love music and just dorking out on it. I'm happy to be part of that circle. Scott David, I got to ask. So when you're singing on these, all of your songs, but especially on these tracks, the high notes that you were hitting were so raw and, and so they just really hit me emotionally and what is it like for you how are you prepping yourself for that we're not going to talk accessories today but if if you do have any let me know what well, that's the that question um, next save that one that's a good one but but how what are you doing to get in the right headspace to deliver such an emotional vocal to these, but also technically, how the hell are you hitting those beautiful notes? And how can you get Ken to do it? <laughs> Cause I will do whatever it takes. <laughs> uh, oh man. That's, uh, I don't, I don't mean it's, it's very flattering. I don't even know how to respond to that. Um, I wish I had like a cooler answer, but, but it, it's really just, it's just feeding off of, of, of the music. I mean, sure, lyrically, eventually, and, and lyrics for me are generally the, the last step with this, this project. So normally what's happening is I'm, I'm just kind of feeding off the music and the emotion of the music and trying to find a range and, and, and an emotion that, that fits with the music. Um, and I'm really happy that, that no one can hear the, the nonsense that I sing when I'm trying to come up with a melody. It's just sort of stream of thought. Um, but it just, I, I don't know. Uh, it, it just, it just kind of came out. 
I mean, the the pitch, the the emotion, all of it was there before the lyrics were. Um, the, the lyrics, you know, obviously deal with with some emotional things as well. But I, I just I just fed off of what was being sent back and forth. And I'll just go ahead and I'll go ahead and say this. I mean, I and this is this is the reason we're working together. Scott David's voice is amazing. Period. I mean, there's nothing more to say about it. There's a handful of people. It's and it's a very small group of people. Being a good singer is one thing. There's a million good singers. There's a million great singers, but there's a certain quality to his voice that draws everybody in. And I and it's it's intangible. It's it's almost hard to describe. There's the notes and all that, like you're talking about, and that's and that's certainly one thing. But there's the timber of his of his voice. And uh, there's just something about it that everybody who hears that voice is drawn in. It's amazing. It's instantly recognizable, for sure. How right. did you get so spoiled, Dan, to have at least like three or four of those people in your, in your circle in your life? Um, how did that work exactly? I, I don't even approach it because I don't want to jinx things. <laughs> I'm I'm the luckiest guy in the world to have these people. I mean, like, yeah, Anya, Chris Conley, you know, like you, you know, Scott David, you you do you like I mean, have some worldwide voices just right in your back pocket all the time. It's it's so uh, yeah, it's unbelievable, really. And and you know, for a guy who like me, I, like I was saying earlier, I've never had the chance to do this kind of music. To have that, to have him be the singer of something like this is more than I could ever ask for. It's unbelievable. What's unbelievable is I'm being mentioned with those people. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't feel in that, that category. Um, I think it, the project's been, thank you, by the way, but I, I think that the project, one very liberating thing about the project is, you know, there's this, you know, there's, there's Dan, there's, there's the Joy Thieves, there's Scott David, the Covenant of the Thorns, but it, it it doesn't really sound like either one of those things. And, and I'm not really confined by what a covenant of thorns is. And, and I can't speak for Dan, but I'm guessing it's similar. It, it opens up a lot of opportunity where I don't have any preconceived notions of what something's going to be, or I, I just go for it. And it just, it is what it is. It's incredibly free. And we should say too, I mean, we were talking about kind of the songwriting process and, and the fun that we're having, you know, going back and forth and doing everything. The, the EP that we're releasing is a five song EP. Mm -hmm. But over the course of last summer, we wrote and recorded maybe 16 or 17 songs. I mean, we, we yeah. literally have the next record written more. Yeah. Now. So there's, there's much more coming. I mean, I, it's, and that's, but I'm just saying that just kind of speaks to how fast and furious the songwriting process went and yeah. how natural this was. It's, it wasn't like, there was no grind at all to write. It was just, it just kept coming and coming and coming for, for months. It's, it's all we did seemingly. It was, it was amazing. It just doesn't happen that way usually. I mean, and it's still, it's still going too. I mean, you just sent me something the other night, which, yeah. <laughs> so, I'm going to, I'm going to change gears and lighten it up for a second, you know, right. to, to lead in Katie, I'm going to set you up on this. Ready? So here we are. I'm going to do a little role playing scenario for you guys. I'm out there in Chicago. You're both Chicago boys now, or, or I mean, at least you're kind of close. Scott David, right? Hey, yeah. so we're out there. We got a dirty 30 of PBR, you know, we're hanging out downtown. We crushed that shit. And now it's time to have a discussion about where we're going to go to get a true Chicago pie. The best pie in town. I've had some pies, okay? And I'm a Detroit, you know, like buddies, pizza, Detroit style kind of guy. But you're going to impress me. Where are you taking me for that pie? And this is a good, again, like to see how in tune you are. Is it going to end up being the same answer? Go. It's it's not going to be the same answer. Dan's gonna Dan's gonna have to do this one. I'm from the West Coast, and, and I'm a Brooklyn guy. I'm, I'm sorry, Chicago's oh, never going to let what me. What do they put on their pizza? Like French dressing or some shit? I wouldn't. No, pizza? it's just really <laughs> on their pizza. Floppy cheese pizza that you fold in half. And I, I realize I'm never going to be allowed into Chicago again. <laughs> uh, I'll redeem myself by saying no ketchup on the hot dog ever. I'll, I but, mean, I'm with you on that, yeah. you know. I still wait for the time that I can take both you boys to Detroit and I'll take you for a real Coney at Lafayette at three in the morning after we play a show. 
But all right, Dan, you go ahead then. Where's this pie coming from? Where are you taking me to? We just finished our Dirty 30 of PBR. Yeah. So typically... Um, We're old style. I, I have an answer that most people aren't going to say. There's, there's a handful of places that a lot of people do say. Mm -hmm. My personal favorite is Giordano's. Okay. That's, they, that's they have, solid. That's... They have a, their deep dish is unbelievable. It's so good. I mean, if you like Chicago style deep dish pizza, for me, that's the best one. That's the one? Okay. Yeah. Pride that's about the one we had at Cold Waves, Colin. That uh, was it. It was Giordano's. But, and we, I cried about the sausage. No, I swear that was the next day. No, it was. Uh, oh, hell, I don't know. But that was the one that yeah. got me. It was the, the sausage from Giordano's yeah. was life changing, life affirming and hangover curing. I'm going to also start pinching my cheeks because as I drink this wine, it'll make it seem like that's the reason I'm rouging up. <laughs> and not from the, right. That's why I did that on purpose to give more color. Wow. Yeah, it, Looking it was, good today, buddy. <laughs> Okay, Dan, I actually had a question specifically for you, and I kind of came up with it as I was editing the last interview that you were a part of uh, for the Pink Floyd cover album. Um, I noticed you have a mohawk, okay? And I noticed that the last interview you were wearing a Wesley Willis shirt, so I was going to ask, do you skateboard? I don't. You never? I don't skateboard. I don't do any activities that could ever wind up hurting me. <laughs> that is I, very fair yeah as a drummer and i've been a drummer since i was five years old i've you know and i i know a lot of people who love skateboarding and all that and for me uh, it was just all about keeping the limbs intact so so no outside of when i was a very little kid and i used to go on a skateboard i would never ever do that because for fear of breaking a hand or a leg i think the other factor katie you might not see is dan is like six nine or some shit like he I is really <laughs> I'm I know, you can't see because he's sitting down, but he's tall as hell. So well, here's something you may not expect. I grew up skateboarding on the hills of San Francisco. Oh man, yeah. were, you like a, were you like yeah, a? Dude, were you hanging out with like Steve Caballero and shit? <laughs> yeah, like this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so given that you, one of you skateboarded and the other one did not, and uh you started playing the drums at a young age what was both of your introductions to music like when did you start playing and how did you get into the instruments that you predominantly play now so i, I can start this one um my father was uh was a radio dj when i was a kid for about 15 years um so my my earliest introduction was was listening to records at home um you know, listening to like Boston and Fleetwood Mac and Donna Summer and stuff like that on vinyl that my dad would play. Um, musically, I think my, my first instrument were probably some pots and pans. Um, my, my uncle was uh, also in, in, is an amazing drummer um, in, in a band in the Bay Area that we'd go see a lot. So that I think was my first passion, believe it or not, was, was drums. Um, after a while, banging on the same pans, I, I lost interest. Um, my mom had a stand-up piano, so I started kind of composing on that. Um, I think about maybe sophomore or junior year of high school, I got my first uh, my first Stratocaster, started playing guitar, and ever since then, it's just been anything I can get my hands on. There's, there's not really any one instrument I can play really well, but I can take a bunch of instruments and turn it into something that sounds vaguely like something. Yeah, I, I started playing when I was five years old, when I was just a really little kid. I, I wanted to, you know, according to my parents that, I mean, from when I was just a toddler, I was constantly like keeping the beat on stuff and just, I, it was, it looked like I was completely destined to be a drummer. So when I was five, I started taking drum lessons. Um, Took them for a couple of years and then and then stopped for a few years and then came back to like fourth grade when like you know band stuff started happening in school and i've been playing nonstop ever since and and literally i've just been the drum guy forever i mean like all through middle school high school i played in i played in everything that i could from jazz band to all the musicals everything you know marching band i was a total band geek i mean all that stuff and then um yeah so i mean i've been playing nonstop for pretty much my entire life. Um, I picked up guitar and keyboard and stuff kind of along the way, but I mean, I'm a professional drummer, so that's, that's my main sort of thing. But it, 
yeah, I've been doing it in one form or fashion for forever, really for my whole life. All right. One last question. And then I promise I'll pass it over to somebody else. What were the names of your first bands? Well, whew. it's a rough one. Let's see. We had, we had the drowning cold, um, Morton kills some, some early ones. Um, good friend of mine, Frank Fuller and I had a number of different, uh, kind of bands going early on long before a covenant of thorns so i think that those would probably be the earliest ones for me and for me i, I can't believe i didn't mention this when i was on doing the pink floyd thing when i my very first real band in high school um all of us were completely just addicted to pink floyd and specifically the wall which i talked about in the other uh podcast but uh the first the very first band i was in we called it perfect isolation which is uh, a lyric from the wall so, so that was it. Perfect isolation. Those are all really solid band names for your first bands. I'm really impressed. They're not nearly as um, as horrible and embarrassing as I, as it could have been, actually. No, no, <laughs> no. They're kind of kind of good. Kind of good, yeah. yeah comparatively, yeah. how about you guys, Ken? What was your first band name? In high school, I had a band with uh, my friend Kirby, who Colin knows, uh, and my friend Justin. We were marching band nerds together too, and then my kid brother. And we were in a band called Antisocial. And I remember we had t-shirts made up that had one of our lyrics on the back that said, if I thought I could care any less right now, I'd try. <laughs> and then it said Antisocial on the front. And that was... Yeah, I love it. We got thrown out of a 4-H fair um, <laughs> for obscene lyrics. Uh, so we were in a battle of the bands at the 4-H fair. And that was kind of the end of Antisocial is that they... Uh, ask us to leave the premises. <laughs> so that's, my first band's name was Spoon. Wait, that already which, is a band. Which, well, this was like 10 years before that, and it was oh. based off of The Tick. Yeah, and The battle cry. battle cry. Yes, so that's a shit name. <laughs> <laughs> Katie? My first band name was uh, Depression Kick. We were we we formed for the eighth grade talent show, and we were gonna do a cover of the Alkaline Trio song "Fatally Yours," but then the principal thought that it had like suicidal undertones, so he was like, "You can't play that anymore." And at the last minute, we decided that we were gonna cover "Everybody's Happy Nowadays" by the Buzzcocks, and my like ex-boyfriend it was like eighth grade or whatever so whatever but he was the singer and he couldn't sing and we tried it anyway and we got made fun of for a very long time and then i moved <laughs> that's well, the best thing to do after embarrassment is just to leave town you know yeah, that's, like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense i'm gonna bring it back to the album because yeah do important. that there's i want to there's a warning that needs to be on this wear waterproof mascara because dusk you close out this album with this heart wrenching beautiful song that i mean i love that song but saxophone what who and thank you oh <laughs> that was journal <laughs> what who and thank you <laughs> I, i'll take blame for that one too um I have a guy, a good friend of mine, his name is Jim Chapman, who I've been, I got a guy, you need sax, I got a guy, yeah. Uh, and, and I've been working with him kind of off and on on recording projects for maybe 10 years. And, and just on a whim, I thought it might be interesting to add a saxophone, which um, it, it's funny. I mean, you, you mentioned it and everybody who's heard the EP basically said the same thing. It's like, what's up with the, that's, it, I was not expecting the sax. Why, why did you do that? And it worked out really, really well. I think. Um, I think it even surprised Scott David. I'll let him. I'll let him address that. But I mean, like, it, it turned out way better than I thought it might, and I was already expecting it to be great. So I think it's it's surprising to hear that sort of element in a song like that. Um, but I know I know what this guy is capable of, and I just had a, a feeling that it might be just what it needed. So. Yeah, I, I think I had probably the first time I heard it, I had the same same reaction that I'm hearing other people had. Uh, I remember <laughs> Dan sent me a message and, and he said, hey, we've got a guy that will do some saxophone. And 
you know, my first thought was, okay. Um, I mean, we're, our whole thing is we're open to whatever. Let's try it. Let's, you know, if, if neither one of us, if one of us doesn't like it, we're not going to do it. If, if we love it, great. I said, all right. Yeah. And, and I remember the first time hearing this, it was just like, whoa, whoa. Um, it, it, yeah, it just, I, still hearing it, it blows me away. It's, yeah, I don't, I, how do we get someone who can play sax like that to, to, to appear on the EP? I'm still, I'm still sort of dumbfounded by it. And I, you know, it, I should mention too that, I mean, the two of us are kind of the main songwriters and we did a lot of the stuff, but I mean, if it weren't for the help of some of these other people, it would not be what it, I mean, we already, we already mentioned Gore. Two, yeah. did, did you want to shout out that you forgot about here? Absolutely, and that's what I'm here to do. Yeah, Gord did all the guitars, like we talked, not all the guitars, but he did guitars on every song, at least. Um, but in the bass, um, my buddy, my production partner, James Scott, did bass on, on four of the songs, and my buddy Bobby Simons did the, the fifth one, and, and James Scott also sang backups with me. We did all the backing vocals together um, at his studio and, and James did a ton of work between James and Gord. They did so much work on this. They really did. And they just shined. Um, my friend Laura was in the studio writing, writing vocals with us and she's an, an amazing singer and writer. So she was be able to write some amazing vocal lines. And, um, and then lastly, Jim, who did the saxophone without these people, it just wouldn't be the same. It really wouldn't. Well, and one important thing we can learn kids the most important thing to take away from Lost Boys is more sax. <laughs> Put saxophone back into modern rock and goth music, for the love of God. The, the greats are doing it right now. You heard it here first, right? <laughs> but I think it was the, honestly, I mean, it seemed like the perfect way to end out this EP. I mean, this is going to be our introduction to people. We were looking... I'm one of those people who I think the last track on any recording is super important. I think it's just as important as the first. I, the way that you go, does it make you want to spin it again? Do you want to stop and sit in silence? What does it make you want to do? So having that be a really powerful was important to me. And I think that was, and I think we did that with Dusk. I, I think sax, there's a lot of different ways you can play a saxophone. And I think any other player, any other style would not have had the impact that, that it did. Um, you know, there's some, there's some bands that have used saxophone very well, but, you know, Duran Duran or Psychedelic Furs saxophone would not have had the same impact that this did. No. Maybe in excess to? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, and this is one of the reasons I work with him. I mean, initially, like I said, 10 years ago when I met Jim, we kind of bonded over our love of Pink Floyd at the time too. This is all tying back into our last podcast, but, um, and that's when he plays the sax, it reminded me kind of, he loves Pink Floyd and he loves that style instead of kind of more rock oriented. Um, yeah, it, it just, there's something about the style where it just works for me. It's just amazing. So I love that we're uh, doing that thing that we love to do at Sounds and Shadows and that's uh, lifting everybody up and talking about it. Another question that I've kind of been doing on these last couple of podcasts and I'd love to fire through to both of you is, Give me a couple people that you're listening to right now. The Sounds and Shadows Facebook group has been awesome and you guys are both contributors on a lot and talking. And so we're all hearing a lot of new music and things like that. Um, Scott, David, tell me first, uh, what's, what's at least one or two things that you've heard lately that got you excited? I, I'm not sure you'd expect this, but um, <clears throat> I've been... I've been really digging some of the stuff coming out of South Korea lately. I think there's a, there's a, there's a perception, there's a perception of, of K-pop and a lot of it is pretty accurate that it's, you know, super bubblegum pop. Um, but there's some really amazing stuff coming out as well that I think a lot of people just haven't been exposed to. Um, so I've, I've gone down a couple of YouTube rabbit holes with, with that lately. Um, I, I think the, the stuff I've heard is really amazing with melody and the intricacies of parts coming in and out. And uh, musically, it's just really interesting as a musician to listen to the stuff. That's awesome. Is there a particular K-pop band that you've heard lately that I need to go check out? I need to do maybe a K-pop review on Sounds and Shadows. Who knows? 
I don't, you know, I don't know that there's one act that from start to finish it is just, you know, it, it's just been, you do have to kind of go through some stuff to find the gems in there because of a lot of it is, is very, very super ultra poppy. Um, and, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm not really closed off to, to, to any style, so that doesn't necessarily bother me, but, um, I, I don't know that like, a lot of other stuff I can sit and listen in, to an entire album from, from start to finish. You know, I can, I can listen to, to slow dive from start to finish. No problem. I, it's not really the same thing. I gotta, gotta kind of work your way through some of the stuff to find the gems in there. Awesome. Well, I, that is really good. You know, I've kind of fallen down a hole like that myself lately that I'm working on a piece right now about Mexican central and South American, like goth dark wave. And I tell you what, like I started down this hole and I've fallen so deep now, kind of like with you, maybe with like the K-pop stuff where I don't even know all the bands that I'm hearing anymore, or it's kind of blurring together country in it, but it just, I start saying to myself, why have I never thought about this my whole life? Like it just kind of is something that until you fall down that hole, you don't realize how rich and storied and how far back a lot of the, the music that you love goes in some of these other countries that criminally don't get play because they're singing not in English, you know? And I mean, I, I would even say like, you know, from this piece, a German dark wave and that, you know, can sing in German and it'll still be popular, you know, in the scene and with audiences, but that just so gets mixed if, you know, you're singing in Spanish and it's absolutely criminal. And that's one of the things I'm really hoping, looking forward to doing with this piece is kind of hoping to shine a, a light on some of these amazing, especially Mexico city and just an unreal scene going on there some some really amazing stuff worldwide going on that I think just because we have such a we have such a huge palette in the states and 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 in Europe to choose from but you know it, lyrics are important but if you if you can get past that barrier of your perceptions of, of what something is and there's some really amazing stuff going on yeah all right, Dan, you're up next. What what are you hearing right now at the moment that's just been spinning your wheels, baby? Uh, you know, I go. You mentioned the page that you're talking about too, the Sounds and Shadows page, which um, which I thoroughly enjoy. I'm on there quite a bit, actually. It's made it's made Facebook quite fun again, actually. Yes. Um, but yeah. and and there's so many music recommendations that happen there, mm -hmm. um, which I love. But it's it can be a little overwhelming. I mean, there's so much new stuff, and there's so many bands and everything. But but one that caught my ear just a couple of days ago was Empathy Test, who I was completely uh, unfamiliar with this band. I, I knew <laughs> nothing about them, and it was amazing. I've been I've been shoveling every single day, and I it's one of the things that I listened to when I was out there shoveling for like an hour. And it, and it just makes me think like, why haven't I heard this before? This, and then I realized so it, it, everyone had been saying, you got to hear these guys, you get, but there's just so many recommendations that, yeah. you know, can only attend to so many really. So, um, so that's one that just kind of really blew me away. It was their last record monsters, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> which we I had them on for a podcast favorite. and they're just great young people and so talented and, and well-spoken and interesting too, but yeah, that was one of those where when you did that post about it, or like, hey, has anybody heard this uh, Empathy Test Monsters yet? This is dope shit. And I was just like, <laughs> dude, I have been screaming that from the mountaintops for a while. I'm just glad you found it, Dan. And yes, 12 out of 10 would recommend. I think Empathy Test Monsters I put as my number one, uh, whatever, uh, Dark Wave or whatever. I put them on the Synth Wave one um of 2020 it just the whole album is freaking phenomenal well that's definitely the reason that i wound up digging it up too i remember i read through the list and i mean we know each other well enough that i can trust your recommendations honestly it's like you know when i read that it's like well that's definitely something i want to eventually hear so i, I would say that was amazing um other than that i kind of cycle through all sorts of different music depending on where my mind is at um the latest bob mold record is amazing I've, I've spun it about a thousand times it's so good katie you look like you like bob mole is that right I do he was supposed to play at bells over the summer but 
everything got canceled. So yeah, but yeah. So his I love him so much. Yeah, his last record is phenomenal, and I and I absolutely adore, adore like a two and a half minute punk pop songs. I think that's awesome. You know, like I, I'm such a fan of that sort of thing, just the sort of hit it and quit it. And he can write them. It's amazing. His last four or five records are phenomenal. They're ridiculous. So yeah, a lot about Bob Mould recently. Can I squeeze another nerd question in? <laughs> Go for it. Ooh. Oh man. <clears throat> I don't even know it. See, the problem is that uh, Plug in Alliance over the over the uh, holiday break, we're we're giving away stuff left and right. So, I, I think right now um, it's probably software based for me. Um, I'm a sucker for for a good profit synth. I think um, Yuhi's got a, a really nice profit five. It's not anything new, but um, I think that that might be my favorite one right now. So we had a, we had a problem between me and Gord <laughs> him through the entire holiday season as everything was going on sale and we were just like oh my god are we going to buy something else I mean we just kept we just kept picking stuff up because they make it so um, cheap during the holidays um, so one of them that I got that we all I think all of us liked was the Overhausen which is a an Oberheim um, software um, amazing sounds in that and then there was another one called Thorn that I've kind of fallen in love with too. Um, for me, any sort of new sounds, any sort of new things that I'm not familiar with spark all sorts of creative energy in me. So I'm, while I'm not really like um, a, a dork when it comes to like the stuff that I have, anything new for me is like the latest thing I, that I have is almost always my favorite because it's sparking the current ideas. Shiny is inspiration. Absolutely. Yeah. Just new sounds. And it's, it's amazing how you just draw up something new and, and instantly ideas start popping in your head where they weren't before. It's kind of a, it's kind of an amazing process actually. Kind of funny because the, the codes were flying. We have this, this three person chat between the two of us and Gord and like every other day, one of us was dropping a code for, for some sense that they were doing. And uh, I think Gordon, Gordon even started describing it. Oh, it was Gordon. Maybe it was you, Dan started describing it as, as the plug in Alliance cult, just because like, it was just all consuming, like, you know, I'm two seconds away from just getting the subscription because they're killing it. I am. Yeah. It's there's so much new stuff, good new stuff this year. It's, it's insane. Well, I mean, and, and even beyond since some of, some of the, the uh, hardware emulations they have, you know, we've got some, some Neve consoles and, and like the people from Neve are actually working on these software. It's incredible stuff. Their SSL plugin emulates multiple channels yeah so you can yeah. run that across like 96 channels and have 96 different it's stupid and, and the thing and to, to totally geek out here the thing that's amazing is the, the people have designed each channel hardware has its own sound right and, and they've captured that in in the software where channel one sounds different than channel 36 it's it's crazy so we just put ken through how i'm gonna stop that now but similar vein, are there any absurd accoutrements you need in the studio when performing, recording, mixing, anything? Something fun and interesting, either that you wear, that's on your monitors or on your mixing console, or just you need to have around you when you're doing work that would, not, that would be surprising? I'm, I'm pretty boring. Um, I don't have to be wearing anything specific. I don't really have any uh, little idols or anything sitting around. I just, I, I just, uh, I guess I'm, I'm all business. I just load up the software, get the mic set up, uh, you know, ready to go. I'm a sucker for, I, I, I typically, I've got a, like a concert t-shirt on or like a band t-shirt. It's, it's kind of important to me for, for some reason while I'm working to find uh, inspiration that way. Uh, but all uh, I'll say, the last few months, I got a Joy Thieves hoodie and I've been wearing it like every day. <laughs> it's been so cold that I've been wearing that. But What are you rocking right now? What t-shirt do you got going? Uh, Astero. Oh, nice. Yeah. 
this is an old school Estero shirt from it's it's new but it, it's like a throwback to our 98 record which i love anyway um but here's here's my guys right here you were asking about things that are on like while, while, where i'm working so i've got these three guys the breaking back <laughs> nice yeah so we got the the breaking bad bottle walt jesse bottle. And, and saul here <laughs> that's awesome they, he's come with yeah they, it comes with a bag of meth and a gun and a uh, coffee <laughs> mug. obviously kids toys yeah totally kids toys yeah but i mean the space balls flamethrower kids love this one <laughs> So right, those guys. So I, I take it back. I got I, I do. I didn't know we were doing action figure show and tell. <laughs> I love this. Everybody's I, showing off their action figures. Well, I, I wanted to include this because I just realized, like, I have my little robots and aliens on my mixers, and that's like the stupid little collection that's been growing, and and I need them there. I do have my my uh, Sandman and Death action figures in the in the studio. I forgot about them. Oh, those are gorgeous. I guess they, they just kind of are, are sitting here, so I didn't really think about them. They're they're always just sort of uh, just like ever present. Yeah, I don't know. I don't I don't think about them. I don't. Okay, time to grab the action figures. We're going to record some vocals. It's. I also have it. Yeah, in my in my office, I keep a lot of the original artwork from the records that I've made. So like the kind of the walls of my office back here are filled with like the original pieces of art that I've used for covers, which is, which is very cool. Yeah, that, I, I love being able to look at those while I'm creating, it's cool. I have on an art dictator shirt. I mean, so that's dope. Got this, go <laughs> love them. Turkey's finest electro clash, like disco punk art dictator. It's dope shit. It's new to me, I'll have to check that one out. They're amazing, it's, They're really it's it's angry abba it's it's abba but like really mad yeah awesome. <laughs> wow all right i'm done that's, okay. that's my questions <laughs> i'm about summed up too other than our final parting shots katie did you have anything else that you would like to put to these uh young gentlemen i do have one question that is just purely y'all stroking your own ego like is there a song that you've written or a lyric specifically that you're super proud of and every time that you hear it you're like i can't believe i wrote that that's so good go ahead scott david because you're horrible at this so i'm gonna make you go first yeah i don't <laughs> i mean i i don't know if i'm allowed to say it but pr probably the, the the ep um I think generally with, with the Covenant of Thorns stuff, I, I, I'm working on it for a year or two at a time and I'm the only one working on it. So, you know, I've said this before, I've, I've heard the same snare drum about 47,000 times. And by the time I actually get to the point where it's, it's released, I don't really go back and, and listen to them. They're I kind of, they're done and I move on to the next thing. So um, this, this EP, because there's, more people involved. I've had a little more freedom to actually sit down and, and, and listen to it. And, and um, I don't know, I, I, I really, I like what, what we're doing. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. I enjoy listening to it. I, and I'll say, and I kind of mentioned this earlier too, but it's, for me, this EP is definitely one of those things like every, and I listen to it a lot. That's the other thing. I mean, like some, sometimes I'm like, what are you saying? Like when I'm done with the Joy Thieves thing, I kind of put it away. It's like, I'll visit that in like two years when my, you know, when I haven't thought about it for a very long time, I literally listen to this EP like a few times a week. And every single time I have the same thoughts, like, I can't believe that's us. I mean, how, how did it, it's, it's so much more seemingly than the sum of the parts, you know, like I love what I do, obviously I love what he does, but together it made this kind of thing that I can't really explain. It's, it's um, kind of a, it's a very cool feeling. And so I would definitely put this up there with things that I kind of can't believe we did and I'm super proud of. Do you guys have any final parting shots? Or I feel like you actually did that in the question I just asked of just final parting shots or, or why people need to be excited about this. But I'll take a, a moment saying we'll have links uh, to all of this in the interview, but go check out 
The Burying Kind. It's a self-titled, right? Yes. Self-titled album, The Burying Kind. I swear, I mean, I hear a lot of stuff and a lot of stuff that I love. But every once in a while, like with the Empathy Test Monsters or Twin Tribes or a few other things, I will look you, hold on, be with me right now in this moment. I will look you right in the eye and say, I've listened to so much stuff that when I hear it, I know it. I, I don't always know why, but I know I heard it. You need this album because it has it. Where and when will this album be available to the public, Dan and Scott David? We are releasing the album on March 12th, which is, which is very purposeful, actually. It was just about a year from when the, we very first decided to work together. So it's kind of a, we, we chose that on purpose. The full circle year anniversary of when we decided to pull the trigger. Um, and and pre-sales for it began two weeks before that. So I think that's the 26th, maybe, of February of this month. So, um, so yes, and the, it officially comes out on March 12th. So the 26, trust me, if you get a pre-order, this is the one that you need. I really can't say enough that I was blown away by this record and you really need to hear it for yourself. Colin, you get anything? I'm hoping that it's still snowing out up here in the great white north when this comes out because I have to say driving through the snow at night and just watching the moon go across these beautiful open fields covered in snow listening to this album has been such a treat and just absolutely perfect and thank you guys so much i love that because i i adore like driving music it's one of those things that like in my life it's one of my favorite parts you know when i'm when i'm traveling back and forth to shows to have like those hours to myself to just be able to soak in music and there are certain types of music that work well for that. And I absolutely think this is one of those uh, recordings, yeah. I think there was a lot of driving involved in the creation of this too, because of, because of how everything is right now. It's like the, if there's an opportunity to go take a drive somewhere and, and listen, you know, how does this sound in the car? How's it? So, yeah. Katie? I'm a huge sucker for shoegaze and synthwave and a lot of elements that are very pronounced in this album and i have to give you both major kudos for putting something out there that is really really great and really unique in its own way because you'll hear a lot of this these genres and they just kind of have this genericness to them where it doesn't have that feeling it doesn't have that luster and what you're putting out to the world is truly a fucking gift so thank you for making this wonderful art. Uh, yeah, that's, that's it. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I mean, that's, I, I love hearing that because I, I hear what you're saying. It's some, of, some of these sorts of genres are well-covered territory. So, and that's why we were kind of, like I said, it wasn't necessarily a plan, but I mean, I think when I listen to it, I hear just as much Posey's music as I hear, uh, slow dive and that was kind of the point of it too is not just not just to do something that's been well covered but to mix up a few different genres that we enjoy and make one cohesive thing um, so I love to hear you say that that that's how you're taking it is is it it's not uh, well covered territory so thank you so much yeah for sure yeah I mean when when no when no genre is off limits it, it makes it a lot easier to just uh, you know if 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 uh, if shoegaze fits in here, it's great. If, if synth works here, so um, yeah, the, the fact that that you hear what what we're hearing in it um, is is high praise. Thank you. Yeah, this has been the Sounds and Shadows podcast. Uh, thank you all for watching. Hey, go down below and hit the like and subscribe. We do a lot of good interviews like this with awesome bands, and you will want to know about it when we have another one coming out. Um, thank you for stopping by. Keep it dark, yo. Dark as fuck.